And quite clearly, this bio threat, ladies and gentlemen, has already upended our notions of community interaction, for example, with face masks and lattice gloves and physical distancing becoming the new normal. Science has been challenged and experts in various fields from the field are struggling to understand uh, the short and long term uh, consequences of this pandemic. And what it clearly goes to show is that the lack of a robust public health system has proven to be a chink in the world's armor. It has revealed the truth that we cannot ignore at our own peril that the healthcare systems around the world have been sorely tested in managing this outbreak. And without substantial reprioritization and investment in public health and research globally, we will be no, frankly, better equipped when the next pandemic strikes. So, you know, Amina Mohammed, the, the Deputy Secretary General of the UN, um, said that we have a health emergency, but we also have a humanitarian emergency, and now we have a development emergency. And these emergencies are compounding existing inequalities. So while no country has been spared, the impact upon families and individuals around the world are exposing huge global and local inequalities. The consequence, for example, of high uninsured rates um, because of out-of-pocket health shocks are revealing itself. Even before the COVID-19 crisis, more than 100 million people were plunging into poverty because of an out-of-pocket health shock. In Kenya, that was about a million people a year getting into poverty year on year because of an out-of-pocket health shock before COVID-19. So imagine how exponentially people are being put into a very, very difficult socioeconomic situation. For example, the World Food Program has said that due to the coronavirus, an additional 265 million people are marching towards the brink of starvation by the end of the year. Because of the effect the virus is already having on jobs and, and finances. So the social economic upheaval that we face today has changed the world and will go on changing, ladies and gentlemen, for many years. Now, behind the headlines of an economic decline that rivals the Great Depression of the 1930s are families that are separated by closed international borders, some mourning relatives they've never managed to see and comfort, and millions who no longer have jobs. So what is it that we should be doing now to prevent ourselves to be in this situation that we are finding ourselves in? So ladies and gentlemen, you know, when the rain that exposes a leaking roof, the coronavirus has revealed an unanticipated problem on our inherent dependence on global supply chains. And this has been amplified. And it has amplified longstanding structural deficiencies in health systems around the world. No country is an exception. No country is bigger than the other. This has been a big flattener, so to speak. We can see now that underinvestment in public health in one country is a threat to the whole global health ecosystem everywhere. So responses to health emergencies cannot succeed if one part, one country, one city, one province, one sub-county is left behind. So therefore, what this pandemic is showing to us is the central importance of universal health coverage and ensuring healthy lives and promoting well-being of all at all ages, which is manifested in the Sustainable Development Goal number three. I take this opportunity to commend President Kenyatta for having chosen his big four and amongst his big four, he prioritized universal health coverage. It was a courageous decision. It was an important decision. And this is precisely what the world needs to embrace. In fact, now in the priorities of the, of the 17 Sustainable Development Goal, without SDG 3 coming up right on top, we are no, no longer uh, going to be um, as strong as we wish to be as nation states. And this is regardless of our economic might, this is regardless of our wealth, this is regardless of our, of our, of our, our armaments, it's, it, it doesn't matter. What matters 
is the importance that underpins human civilization. What underpins a progressive economy? In sub-Saharan Africa, just six countries, Kenya, Ethiopia, Uganda, Rwanda, Tanzania, uh, Sudan, would have a population that would cross probably up to 700 million. To me, that's the opportunity of a demographic difference. Africa can be the largest producer and consumer of goods and services. So in order to do that, what is it that we need to start prioritizing immediately? To me, SDG3 or the centrality of universal health coverage is going to be absolutely crucial. So what would that mean? It would mean that we need to reassess our policy priorities and direct much more funding towards health. We need to invest much more in disease prevention. We need to have improved working conditions for all medical staff. We need to offer fit for purpose health insurance to our people. We need to harness big data technology and innovation to leapfrog universal health coverage. We need to forge new forms of public-private partnerships to address the gaps to attain the SDG3. And finally, and most importantly, we need to create an army of tech-savvy community health workers. Now, this is going to be the new ecosystem of employment. We need to, like this company that was um, the, in, in, in um, Kitui, County, which was featured in the Washington Post, which, um, which uh, this factory re rewired itself and started to produce 30 to 50,000 face masks a day. But it is clear that in the next 10 years, the healthcare business in Africa is, was before the pandemic was likely to be about 300 billion. I see this, I'm just giving it a wild guess, but 300 billion was the opportunity of the healthcare business in Africa by 2030. To me, I think the opportunity is now goes into perhaps a trillion or, or um, 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 a trillion dollars or perhaps even more. So around the world, ladies and gentlemen, we have to look at where does Kenya itself as a nation state, which also championed the sustainable development goals. In fact, those of you who may not be aware, but Kenya was one of the few countries together with Ireland and Hungary that co-chaired the Open Working Group, which resulted in the success of the Sustainable Development Goal. So hurrah to Kenya. Kenya actually can be a beacon of hope and, and a leader in the kind of transformation in the COVID and in the post-COVID environment. But there are a few fundamentals that we have to manage. Being the youngest population with a median age of 18, which is most of Africa, the COVID-19 should not worsen the situation of women and young people. And that is what we have to completely safeguard against. Right now, global COVID-19 is worsening the situation of women who are already at risk, be it in abusive relationships, be it millions you know, who are being, because of emergency regulations, are, are at home with their abusers, out of the gaze, or otherwise who could have offered them help. One in three women globally, and this is not exceptional to Kenya. In Kenya, we've seen a 46% spike in sexual and gender-based violence, but it's a global phenomenon. Where one in three women is, is experiencing sexual violence from an intimate partner. Now these have health consequences. And the United Nations Population Fund says that the COVID-19 lockdown is disproportionately affecting women and children, which is resulting in millions of, of, of more cases of violence, child marriage, female gentle mutilation, unintended pregnancies. So the new data, as Natalia Khanem, the executive director of UNFPA said, that this could have a catastrophic impact on women and girls globally, and we need to safeguard that. So the well-being and economic resilience are being threatened because of COVID-19, because of the lockdown. This pandemic has an alarming potential to reverse the hard-won socioeconomic gains that inspired uh, in March 2020 when the Secretary General, uh, Mr. Antonio Guterres, launched a global appeal. He said, for an, he asked for an immediate global ceasefire and asked all border parties to silence their guns, to facilitate delivery of aid and open up space for diplomacy. This virus does not discriminate. The most powerful uh, places like the White House and, and then um, uh, uh, where the Prime Minister um, of, of Britain stays, 
which cannot be permeated by anyone got permeated by a virus. So fundamentally, it's very important to recognize that today over 5 million people are infected. Over 300,000 people have died. So going back to the Secretary General's call on ending violence, ending conflict, just as the world is desperately right now seeking a cure to end coronavirus, the pandemic, which has le left a trail of human economic and social misery, the world too must find a way to end wars or else, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be defeated as a civilization. Let me now shift to Kenya specifically and what is the United Nations family in Kenya doing to address this crisis? So just a quick sequence of chronology. In early March, by the 20th of March, we convened the United Nations country team together with our development partners, the key donors, and with the government of Kenya, convened a meeting at the UN conference. And it was a meeting of solidarity. It was a meeting to tell the government of Kenya that the UN system is in lockstep with the government's efforts to defeat the, uh, the, the, uh, the coronavirus pandemic. By the 9th of April, what we did was a complete reprogramming of our UN development assistance framework to Kenya, which, is, which covers the period of 2018 to 2020. In this, we redeployed about 45 million US dollars or around 5 billion Kenya shillings from our existing UNDA to support the government of Kenya's response to the COVID crisis. On the 9th of April, we launched a global flash of 267.5 million dollars in order to see what we could do to scale up our response, how we could better respond to Kenya's needs. How do we make this public health emergency a viable, robust response? And we not just respond, but what can we do in building foundations for not just an in-COVID, but a post-COVID environment? We deployed about 80 of our staff, the best of our national and international staff to work with the government in communications, in the data area, in the emergency operations center, as lab technicians. But Kenya is also at the same time that we are dealing with the COVID-19 crisis, we are fighting an invasion of the locusts, which potentially threatens food security for over 10 to 12 million people. So the entire uh, flash appeal that we launched were actually addressed to, to address the needs of 10 million people, but this did not include the people that could potentially get affected by the locust invasion. So we redeployed, ensured that we were able to, in our appeal, get an additional $25 million to just respond to the locust. And this will have to be dealt with in a regional configuration, Somalia, Ethiopia, Uganda, South Sudan, all of us, all these countries in the neighborhood are affected. And then is the floods. And this floods, as you know, ladies and gentlemen, is causing havoc. So essentially, the United Nations system is working with a government which is battling what I would call is a humanitarian trident, a trident of crisis, COVID, floods, and then the locust invasion. On the hinterlands, on the border areas, we have the continuing threat of cross-border terror attacks. All these have to be simultaneously addressed. There, there cannot be a, a prioritization done one over the other. When we respond to the floods and we get people out of harm's way, we concentrate them in shelters. We are actually making them much more vulnerable to the speed and the virulence and the velocity of the virus. So it's also very contradictory, the nature of this emergency. But what we are very clear on is that we are here in lockstep with the government and with the people of Kenya to be able to respond to this. I would just want to conclude by saying that now is the time for us as a country where the UN system is with you, where the development community is with you, is to redefine, reframe on how we now deal with this public health crisis because the socioeconomic engines need to also change the focus. Health, agribusiness, you know, uh, affordable housing, manufacturing need to now be spirited with a, with, a, with a public health vision into the future. And frankly, 
when you have populations that are healthy, they become wealthy, and they become, and they become wise. So reaffirming how important that the sustainable development goal number three has become, it has virtually become the anchor to the success of the rest of the sustainable development goals. It's become the anchor to the success of global economies. It has become the anchor that will be the pathway for resilient societies, resilient communities, because the success of SDG3 will mean we have to look at climatic issues. We have to look at water issues. We have to look at you know, issues around education. So in a sense, health itself now becomes uh, 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 like an octopus where the center is health, but the tentacles are the, are the rest of the sustainable development goals. So regardless of the crisis we face at the moment, to me, this is an important opportunity to reaffirm the importance of public health, to reaffirm the importance of growth and development and human capital. And human capital does not develop. As I, as I quoted, the, uh, quoted the, uh, the Greek philosopher, and I would just want to once again, quote him, because I think it's very important. When Herophilus said that when health is absent, wisdom cannot reveal itself, art cannot manifest, strength cannot fight, wealth becomes useless, intelligence cannot be applied. SDG3 therefore becomes the pivotal point from which we can now rearrange on how we advance the sustainable development goals and prepare ourselves for the next pandemic. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Seed. Uh, we've started receiving the questions. Um, I have a first question here from a participant by the name Amos. And his question is on the impact of the virus on the quality of education, goal number four. Uh, would we see more incorporation of technology going innovations on education, on the education sector going forward, uh, considering some of the shortcomings of integration of technology into education such as connectivity and interpersonal learning employed in traditional education. How will this be addressed in, in future policy making and development? You know, it's a very important question, Amos. And, and the fact is, we are much better off in Kenya compared to Somalia or South Sudan or many parts of Africa. You know, when I said that Kenya is a beacon of hope, I don't say that lightly. I was actually with um, CS Joe Machiru in January on a visit to the Silicon Valley. It was a joint visit of the UN and the government of Kenya. And the whole purpose of that visit was how do we leverage new partnerships of disruptors in the Silicon Valley to the disruptors in the Silicon Savannah, the Silicon Savannah being Kenya? How do we bridge the two so that we could actually use big data technology and innovation to leapfrog not just education, but all of the SDGs? That is the opportunity that we have here. And that is what we can use to transform. In fact, today, a lot of my work is happening just the way I'm, I'm speaking to all of you. Otherwise, there was every likelihood by the time you were congregated at the Aga Khan uh, um, uh, auditorium, and uh, let's say I got caught in traffic and other people got caught in traffic, and then we'd all land up there and we'd st be starting an hour later. Suddenly, we are starting things on time suddenly productivity has gone up. So I think fundamentally, how do we address the needs of children? And that is going to be the most crucial part. And that's why the UN, together with the government of Kenya, and as you know, the president of Kenya is, the, is a global leader of the, of the um, Generation Unlimited, which is about ensuring that every young person in the world is either in training or in school or in employment. Now, in order to achieve that, that training today, given the COVID-19 pandemic, has given us, moved us on to, uh, on to the virtual space. What kind of education and training can we give young people to be able to use that knowledge that they gain on the virtual space to be able to be productive there? Can we not be learning the entire value chain of agriculture, for example, in the virtual space with some hands-on training with companies and factories? It's, you know, what will limit us to achieve uh, goal number four, frankly, is our imagination. I believe that Kenya can be the pathway to showing to the rest of Africa how this could be done, given that it's also a hotbed of innovation. So I'm quite confident that if we were to put our heads together and you have the leadership of your president, you have the leadership of, 
of Joe Michiru, the CS for ICT, who's really moving this agenda at a, at a pretty rapid pace. And this is where the opportunity is really going to be. Over to you, Alex. So uh, the next question that I hand over to Njoki is from Alvin, uh, who asks, what are the positive impacts of COVID-19 pandemic on Kenya's SDGs? Uh, you know, I, as I mentioned, you know, that we will, many of the SDGs would get into what I would term as a slow start. But it should, but the SDGs must continue to be the, the North Star for all of us. It is something that the entire world has agreed on. But within the SDGs is what I would term as the big four development agenda and Kenya, uh, you know, uh, uh, Vision 2030. Frankly, if we were to achieve what the big four does, and if we were to make sure that by 2030, every Kenyan has access to universal health coverage, I really think that most of the SDGs would start to get addressed. When you look at a space like agribusiness, it's going to create massive number of jobs. Agribusiness in Africa is going to be about 1.1 to 1.5 trillion dollars worth by 2030. The world's population is increasing. Therefore, the demand for food will increase. It's a simple economic model. Affordable housing. Today, can we use uh, you know, uh, 3D printed technology, the data, the technology, and the innovation that can actually ensure that we could get large number of homes available for the people that are unable to afford the, the normal way of home building. Manufacturing, that space from the entire healthcare ecosystem will all lead to a progress on the SDGs. To me, frankly, the four, the big four agenda is like a multiplier for all of the SDGs. Over to you. Thank you, Steve. Um, so we have a question here from uh, Mukhtar Abdi Ogle, who is asking what the UN system strategy, um, strategic synergy is doing in addressing the challenges of the locust invasion floods and the COVID-19. So he's asking that you enumerate the actionable interventions that have been um, conducted so far. Well, I'm, I'm really pleased to hear that Mukhtar is on the other line. Uh, you know, Mukhtar and I have this constant challenge because, you know, I keep telling them that my alma mater, Princeton University, is better than Harvard, and that's the common argument that we keep having. So he <laughs> says Harvard is better. <laughs> But Mukhtar is a great guy, and, and Mukhtar has asked, asked the right question. You know, Mukhtar, for us, for example, FAO is right now leading the locust response and is actually working with the Ministry of Agriculture in containing the locust invasion. But the, the containment won't succeed if we don't simultaneously contain it in Juba land in Somalia and simultaneously contain it in, in Uganda and simultaneously contain it in, in southern Ethiopia. So it has to be a multifaceted, integrated effort where we will need the leadership of EGAD and the, and, and the regional platforms to make sure that it's a simultaneous push. We could actually defeat it in Kenya, but what if we defeat it and then two months later we get another invasion of locusts? It's like the COVID. If you don't stop it at one place completely, you, it, it will continue to spread. And that is precisely what the locusts are doing. And right now the floods is making it worse because it's providing the ideal environment for the locust to thrive. And therefore, we'll have to deal with this simultaneously. So on the flood response, you know, Alex, I have to be honest, we have agencies like UNHCR, which is actually moving supplies from the Kakuma refugee camp to respond to people's needs in, in West Poco. We have UNICEF, UNFP, UNDP, UN Women, organizations that have really come together to respond. Today, what Kenya is doing is showing that the entire UN system has come together under the development reforms that the Secretary General has put and is pushing that agenda to make sure that we deliver as one. So viably, real work is happening on the ground. But the most important thing is that access is going to be absolutely mission critical. We need to make sure that we reach the most vulnerable, those who are left behind in the development trajectory. Because this virus is also exposing not just global inequalities, but local inequalities too. And we'd have to guard for that. So Mukhtar, important question. We cannot allow anybody to be left behind and to fall further down in the, in, in the poverty index. So it's, it's, it's work under the leadership of the government of Kenya, the UN is completely committed to doing and is doing. Over to you. 
Right, so we have a question here from Anil Hamid, who is asking about the issue of knowledge and application in local contexts and uh, what indigenous um, knowledge should we be exploring to address the contemporary challenges and the SDGs more generally? Well, you know, Kenya, to me, has been very much at the forefront of, of innovation and, and technology. Look at, look at the MPESA system and what it has done. Today, Kenya is, the, is second, I think, only to Sweden in terms of cashless transaction. What it does to empower people in terms of cash transfer, this is indigenous knowledge. This is knowledge that Kenya developed post-elections -ele violence of 2007-2008 and what MPESA today now represents to, to the whole world. And today it has simplified payment of bills. Can we actually start looking at generating more resources for, let's say, the healthcare business in, in, in Kenya? How do we finance universal health coverage? Can we consider a Robin Hood tax that out of every M-Pesa transaction from, from let's say, uh, 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 10,000 shilling upwards, that we actually have a small tax. Anybody arriving, going out, um, uh, departing from the Jomo Kenyatta airport ends up paying a $1 tax. We'd actually done a, a calculation on this, Alex, that we could be generating close to about two and a half to five million dollars a day for public health through a ring fence uh, Robin Hood tax in this country, which would mean all border crossings, airports, and on the MPESA. Here is an opportunity to actually test out a system to do that, because we should not be relying on loans from anybody to improve our health system. That is something we should be able to do ourselves. Let's get the loans for agriculture. Let's get the loans for infrastructure where we can actually repay. But healthcare, education should be country driven. And this is where we want to be working very closely with the government of Kenya to see what kind of technology and innovation we could apply to this. Over to you. Yeah, so thanks. See, the, the next question is on a recent report which shows that only 22 out of 100 Kenyan children are actually learning. And they're wondering whether this will exacerbate the crisis uh, of literacy and just access to good education and widen the gap between the rich and the poor. Uh, is there anything that the UN system, under the cooperation you've described, uh, is doing with the Kenyan government to address this uh, potential risk for exacerbating inequality in education? As a matter of fact, as we speak, UNICEF and UNESCO are working with the Ministry of Education to address precisely that. Which means that we need to, and this is what uh, uh, I know that I've, I've also had several conversations with CSGO Machiru. In fact, the entire UN country team met with him on the Generation Unlimited uh, initiative, which is about ensuring that every young Kenyan is in training, in education, and in employment, which means we have to exponentially improve our IT infrastructure. This is a fabulous opportunity for public private partnerships, for example, to be able to improve the IT infrastructure so that the remotest village, whether you're sitting in Moyale or you're sitting in, in, in uh, Suba sub-county in, in, in Homa Bay, or you're sitting in, in, uh, in some remote part of Kiliti County, you are connected. I think connectivity is going to be the key to unlocking the real potential that we could tap into in terms of the virtual space. As we start to contain the virus, yes, many children, including my own son, are affected by, by uh, uh, the absence of the physical um, environment uh, of, of, of teachers training and all that. And maybe this gives, us, this gives us an opportunity to revisit how learning is going to take place. Do we need 100 students sitting in a place to learn? Or Alex, you're sitting right there uh, together with uh, Joki and you, know, you could actually be running for me a lesson on, on, on good public health and, and the economics of public health right now in that very empty space, but you could have 300 people listening into from their comfort of their home. I think this is where this new opportunity is going to be. In fact, it will democratize learning. It will, you don't have to have, you know, belong to a particular school or have a particular education. Here is where we can use, you know, the intellectual capital that Alex is bringing to the table and you have a much larger audience of students who can benefit from this sort of learning. Important time to rethink our, own, our whole education system 
starting from early learning or the early childhood development for, for young children to as we progress through our secondary into our, into our tertiary years. Many things need to get revisited now. Perhaps this is that opportunity. Don't forget, there was one critical thing that came out of the Spanish flu, for example, from 1918 to 1920. It had a severe impact on global economics. It had a severe impact on public health. But do you know one good thing that came out of it? Women got into the workspace which, where men were no longer there. And suddenly equality in the Western world started to happen. And particularly after the Second World War, you really saw women getting into the equality space. Maybe this is what this, we don't know what the outcome of this pandemic is, but let's use this pandemic as an opportunity to course correct. And perhaps this is where Kenya politically, socially, economically can play a huge role in the sub-Saharan African space. Over to you. So see, the next question relates to a lot of points that you made. You talked about a demographic dividend. Uh, the president, when he spoke about uh, uh, his stimulus package, uh, brought the statistic that 70% uh, of Kenya's population is actually here. And you also mentioned in your conversation that the median age is about 18. This, this question, this listener is wondering whether the economic recovery plan should therefore be youth focused uh, because they actually constitute the largest part of the population. I'm sure you've been in discussions with the president and the UNDP and the UN co uh, uh, colleagues about how to position Kenya's stimulus. Is this conversation at the fore of some of the discussions that you, you, you and your colleagues are having? Absolutely. So the, so the UN has what is called a socio-economic recovery plan where I've tasked UNDP to be the technical lead for this. And we are actually working with the office of the president um, in this. We have uh, Mr. Eric Aligula, then we have the Ministry of Treasury. So we are working very closely and this feeds into what CS Cobia is doing. If you recall that just earlier in the conversation, I said there are two critical elements for the success of the SDG. One is youth and one is gender. Now, let me give you a few important statistics. In 2016, UNDP launched a, a report called the um, uh, uh, Human Development Report for Africa, which was about women's empowerment and accelerating uh, equality. Sub-Saharan Africa loses $95 billion every year because of inequality, because of women not being in their workspace. Over 70% of not just Kenya's youth, but the Africa's youth are less than 30. So in order to reap a demographic dividend, we have to invest in what I would call the four E's. First is education and skills. This is precisely what CS Macheru, together with many cabinet secretaries of education and, and devolution with CS Mamalwa in treasury with CS Yachani are doing is, what do we do? in order to make sure that the education and skill sets become omnipresent and accessible to Kenyan youth. And that skill set will mean it's not just the education that we get at school, it's the informal part, it's the vocational skills part, and therefore the big push towards that. And therefore, if you look at present Kenyatta's stimulus package, it is very much focused on that. So we will need the skills that will be needed now in order to should I say course correct and get more and more young people employed in different sectors, like I mentioned the value chain of agriculture or as tech savvy community health workers. I mean, we need armies, we need millions of community health workers if we need to start preparing for the next pandemic. They could have dignity of labor. They could actually be getting a small, uh, a small stipend on a daily or a, or a monthly basis. It will improve health systems outcome. So this is being very carefully looked at. I mentioned the Generation Unlimited because this is an all of UN country team initiative, which is feeding into the socioeconomic uh, uh, recovery plan. And the whole focus of this is on young people, because if we don't invest there, it's like Roosevelt once said, you know, he said that if we, we may not be able to build a future for the youth, but we can build the youth for the future. And this is precisely what the socioeconomic plan is, is, is back to us. So this will mean ensuring education and, 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 and skills. This will mean ensuring empowerment. This is the second E, which is women's empowerment. That means less and less girls getting early marriages or, or female gentle mutilation happening to them. They are allowed to finish their schooling, achieve their full human potential. As the UNFP executive director often says, we must achieve the 
three zeros of zero violence against women, you know, zero unmet uh, contraceptive uh, and, and, and zero, uh, you know, uh, uh, women being left out of the, of the of, or, or zero women becoming vulnerable to reproductive health issues. And you have the first ladies beyond zero campaign, which is precisely about that. So imagine that empowerment, what it will do for women and girls who will then become equal players in the workspace. The third is employment. And Alex, we need a, a Marshall plan, the, a, a, a Marshall plan that happened in Western Europe post Second World War. We need a plan of similar ambition for Kenya and Africa. And this is where if the West is smart, the United States, the West, the Asian Tigers, which are all aging, by the way. Now, if you, this is what the Marshall Plan did for Second World War Europe. It ensured that, that, uh, that Europe became rich and prosperous. It created a new market, and it made a new set of allies for the U.S. It took Europe out of poverty. This is precisely what the Marshall Plan in Africa needs to do, because this is where the new consumption and production is going to happen. This is where the population will be 2.3 billion by 2050. And this is where, should I say, the tectonic shifts of humanity are going to take place. So it's an opportunity of a life. And the four, so the, I told you about three is education and skills, empowerment, employment, and last is equity. And equity is very important because if you look at violent extremism, if you look at violence and instability in society, it is all pegged on a sense of deep inequality. And equity must be there. Nobody should be left behind. I mean, you had, a, uh, you had Mukhtar Ogle on the line. Mukhtar Ogle is a young boy who came from Wajir County. Look at his story. He got polio. His mother thought because he was so bright that it must be some, uh, someone who passed a bad omen on him and said, you know, he will recover. He didn't. And his polio got worse. But yet the guy kept on at it. But the, there were opportunities opened up for him that he went and became a Harvard Kennedy School alum. We have a boy out of the Dadaab refugee camp. He's featured in, uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in the New York Times. Emma the same. He uh, grew up in Dadaab refugee camp, got the Kenyan education system. He entered my university, Princeton, as, as an undergraduate. So the potential opportunities that this country can provide, let me tell you, is just simply enormous. I mean, if you see a sense of optimism in my voice, ladies and gentlemen, I have seen Kenya since 2014. I have seen the transformation that has happened where in counties which have the highest maternal mortality ratios, Mandera, Vajir, Marsabet, Lamu, Isiolo, Garissa. I have seen how they've reduced those maternal mortality ratios by one third. I have seen Mandera providing health services for chikungunya and cholera to people from Somalia and Ethiopia. I have seen, you know, young Kenyans who have who are driving innovation, change, and technology. So if you see the sense of optimism, it is because I've seen it real time. It's not, it's not based out of a perception or a vision. And this is where it's going to happen. So let's invest in those four E's. And that is going to be mission critical if we want to move Kenya accelerate Kenya's rapid economic engines because a rich Kenya will mean a rich neighborhood. A rich neighborhood means a more stable neighborhood. A more stable neighborhood means a happier neighborhood. And this is where we see a critical leadership role for Kenya in the Horn of Africa. Over to you. Great. Um, so we have um, a request here from Arif Neki, who is asking if you could talk a little about public-private partnerships um, and how COVID-19 is galvanizing those opportunities currently and even in a post-COVID-19 world, if ever there will be one. You see, I'll go back to what I said when we, when we started talking about why we need to reprioritize public health to become the, should I say, the sphere point or the vanguard for our recovery plans. And let me go over the seven points that I made there because I think it's important. And, and Alex, um, you know, you're, a, you're, you're a brilliant public health man and, and, and we could have a separate discussion on this. But let me just repeat that. Reassess policy priorities which direct more funding to health, invest more in disease prevention, improve working conditions for medical staff, 
offer fit for purpose health insurance to their to our people harness big data technology and innovation to leapfrog universal health coverage create an army of community health workers and finally and most importantly kenya did this it forged a public private partnership platform way back in 2015 when i mentioned these six counties of mandera wajir marsabet lamu isuor and garissa six companies glaxo smith klein safaricom huawei kenya healthcare federation philips and merck joined this initiative Bob Collymore, our departed late Bob Collymore, went and announced this commitment at the UN General Assembly in 2015. And together we saw that a public-private partnership actually worked in some of the remotest parts, which were considered pretty dangerous at that time. But we managed to get there, thanks to the leadership of the government of Kenya, thanks to the leadership of the county governors, thanks to a robust commitment of people wanting to see change, and it changed. for example in my own country reducing maternal mortality ratios by one third ladies and gentlemen is not easy and alex can tell you that it can take 10 to 15 years in kenya it took 3 so therefore when i say that there's a sense of optimism public private partnerships are going to be the future of what i would term as a new renaissance of the of 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 multilateralism it will underpin the new multilateralism because look how hard the private sector has been hit because of the covid crisis it has completely evaporated the gains made i mean today major companies who you thought were too big to fail have started to fail they've started you know going in for bankruptcy they are going in for uh, you know appealing for government aid suddenly john maynard keynes who during his own lifetime had little recognition today has become the need of the the man of the hour and and today most of our economics is turning keynesian so the new order will be public private partnerships because the private sector also needs a healthy population for its own survival look at the tourism sector one in five or one in six kenyans is involved in the service sector that is where the unemployment is coming in so we will have to look at the whole ecosystem of how this is going to work but we will continue to need strong robust governments to lead it but we need strong institutions like the world health organization like the united nations system coming together converging convening catalyzing these partnerships to have impact not locally but at scale globally over to you so see this question of women women empowerment and the role of education uh, seems to be extremely critical for most of our listeners and dr nancy booker is making this the uh, the session that well empowering women and girls is one way of reducing sexual and gender based violence against women uh, but she observes that higher education still excludes many women participation in higher education is not as high as what we've seen in in, uh, in primary school and, and secondary school education uh, she's asking what are some of the practical suggestions that you might have to bridge this gap how do you get more women to participate in higher education uh, in Kenya uh, at least going beyond what progressive policies seem to get us to which is just near parity in, in secondary education but when you come to higher education uh, this is still this is still a problem uh, it remains unsolved and i think it then has this this knock on effect in still disempowering women in critical sectors of the economy what are your thoughts it's an important question i mean look when you want to, when i spoke about a demographic dividend you know is a word which is very loosely used i think it has a bit of an uh, intellectual echo to it so people tend to use it but what does demographic dividend really mean demographic dividend means when there are more people in the workforce and less dependents and that makes the role of the women central that means the primacy of sexual reproductive health and rights is going to be absolutely mission critical so that that woman from the time she is born to the time she goes through a level of schooling is unencumbered by the obstacles of early marriage and female genital mutilation and teenage pregnancy all those things and is able to achieve her full human potential when she's able to do that she becomes a gainful purpose person in the employment belt and then she can decide when and how many children she wants to have and that reaps the demographic dividend so if you look at western europe post second world war because women entered the workforce because women were better equipped and better trained and better skilled 
the men and women were both earning. As a result, there was more disposable income. There were lesser children, more opportunities for the children for better nutrition, better education, better health, better opportunities. And they reaped a demographic dividend because the whole human capital started to progress. This is precisely what we need. And therefore, to, to answer if that was Nancy's question, we need affirmative action. Affirmative action where the government must legislate. It has criminalized FGM. It has criminalized child marriage. How do we make sure that that doesn't happen? How do we make sure that the democracy of education is able to enter that household of, of little uh, Sabina in, in Marsabet County to that of little Rachel in Homa Bay County? That is what we need to see happen. And this is where we should be holding the governors and the national government to account by having a gender audit year on year to show which counties are making progress and which counties are not. I think if we start to do that and ensuring that we have gender-based budgeting today, UN Women, UNFPA, UNICEF, UNDP are working in lockstep with the Ministry of, of, of Gender to look at how do we better improve and equip women into the new generation of work. But that can only happen when there is legislative action, when there is affirmative action. So I'm, you know, I'm using this platform to once again appeal to the president of Kenya and to everybody else in, in the Kenyan government that the two-third gender bill becomes even more important now because we need women in the political space too to be able to make this groundswell of activism happen and that groundswell of equality will happen when you do have strong women also driving it. Over to you. Uh, yeah, but so Sid, uh, this, you're not running away from this one. So there's still another question on gender. Uh, and this is about, uh, it's one thing to bring women just like you've described, affirmative action, all of that, legislating and providing a basis for women to get into higher education, get into workplace. But there's another danger in there with uh, sexual uh, uh, abuse, harassment in the workplace. And then many organizations across the world have been hit by this. Uh, uh, it's another pandemic, uh, actually. So what are some, and then the, we have the UN women that you've talked about a lot in your conversation. Are there any kind of systematic institutional mechanisms at a UN level that would then support institutions and countries to, to enforce uh, a safe working environment for women uh, once we unshackle them from all the encumbrances that prevent them from getting in the workplace and contributing to economic development? Yeah. You know, when men treat women badly, when we treat women with disrespect, when you're seeing the scourge of, of sexual gender-based violence where CS Copia said in Kenya alone, we've seen a 46% spike in sexual gender-based violence after the lockdown. But it's, as I said, it's become a global phenomenon. From the US to the UK to the most advanced uh, countries in the world, we are seeing that same pattern. You know, Alex, I think perhaps it's an important opportunity for us to hold up a mirror to ourselves as a society on how we treat our sons and daughters, how we treat them differently. I come from a country where, by and large, one in four child that is malnourished in the world is a girl child, because the boy will be fed better than the girl if the, if the, if the income of that household is weak. The boy will get a better chance for education compared to the girl. Now, when this gets into the conscience of people, after all, you know, when a policeman who does not bother to take the case of a, of a woman who's been sexually violated, raped, abused, it's because he's made to believe that boys will be boys. So we need a systematic change across society. We need leaders at the political level, but we need yourself and me, Alex, as fathers at home on how we bring that change in. Because this is a cultural change. But you know, many people say, oh, you know, culture takes time to change. I'm sorry. We, we don't have time. If we are looking at the sustainable development goals and we are talking about SDG 5, this is the decade of action. We have merely 10 years to achieve that. So it will mean uh, what I would term as a three-pronged approach. Number one is strong public advocacy at every level, from the media to the social media, to every other, other sphere. Number two is to make sure that at every school, every university, every teacher, every public servant has gone through a proper sensitization on gender issues. And finally, 
is to make sure that the sledgehammer of justice must accompany, and it should be very, very visible to anyone who violates the basic rules of decency when it comes to issues around sexual, uh, sexual uh, and gender-based violence. In fact, I recently wrote a piece in, in Forbes Africa where I talked about that, that actually sexual reproductive health and rights must be a weapon in our arsenal to defeat future pandemics. It's absolutely mission critical to do that. So which means that we need a collective change. And frankly, how do we empower, you know, let's say uh, former army veterans from the Kenyan military who are in retirement, who get a pension, can we start to use them and say, guys, we need you men and women, we need you to be a role model in your village and community. How do we empower governors to have a, let's say, that's what I go back to, to become models of advancing the whole issue of, of gender equality. This will finally happen when we start looking at things through that gender lens. Till such time we believe that men are superior to women and that men can do what they want and get away with it, we will continue to have this challenge. So I think, you know, the, the, the episode of um, uh, what happened in the US uh, with Harvey Weinstein has suddenly thrown a picture to the global challenge that the world faces. And what we have to do is as the UN system, with the government, as civil society and people like yourselves, Alex, in universities, the media come together and take a unified posture because our survival, our progress, our, our wealth is going to be underpinned by equality of gender. So I, I just, you know, it's a long-winded way of answering it, but we have to tackle it with robustness and a level of, 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 of affirmative action. Over to you. Right. So Irene Wakesho here is taking us back to universal health coverage. And she's asking how we can leverage partnerships between private and public hospitals um, to enhance um, sharing opportunities, especially around technology, research, and accessibility. Um, what do you think about this, Sid? Absolutely. I mean, you know, I go back to what I said in those seven policy recommendations I made, because today what you have seen is, let's, let's, let me give you a very interesting example. You know, um, uh, the, um, the Mount Sinai Hospital in, 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 in New York um, is like a really top, top line hospital. I think its annual budget is anywhere between two to $2.5 billion uh, a year. The World Health Organizations, which covers the whole world, their annual budget is two to $2.5 billion a year. So you can imagine where you are looking at a custodian of global public health is constantly in a state of dire economic stress in order to meet some of the global challenges that they are confronted with. So, Really now, I see this as an opportunity where the private sector needs the public sector and, the, and vice versa, the public sector needs the private sector in order to develop robust research, robust responses, early warning. Because what I said was the private sector has been hardest hit by this particular pandemic. Today, planes are grounded. You know, I mean, Germany had to intervene recently, the, the, the Keynesian theory, in order to, you know, uh, save uh, Lufthansa from bankruptcy. So the economics, in a sense, has got a little regressive there. But who would have thought that that could ever happen? I see this as the opportunity of correcting, should I say, where the public sector and the private sector were at two different levels. I come from a country which where many Kenyans go to, to because of the private sector and the, uh, you know, the Apollo hospitals and all that for tertiary treatment. Why? We can do it right here in Kenya by converging precisely what I talked about, making the public-private partnership work from healthcare, from the preventative side to the curative side. In fact, in my view, Kenya could actually become the future destination of, 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 of uh, healthcare. But how will it do it? It will do it by bridging this particular divide of the public and the private sector. And in many ways, it is showing the way. Over to you. So, see another question on uh, universal health. So, Joseph Fodindo uh, says you sound very optimistic about improvements in the health sector as a result of lessons learned from COVID. Uh, but he wonders and asks whether you're aware of any specific initiatives taken by the Kenyan government, which shows that it is practically moving towards achieving universal health coverage. You know, uh, sorry, what is the name of the colleague who asked the question? Uh, Joseph Odindo. 
Yeah, Joseph, you know, I mean, you know, I have to give credit to the government where it's due. Even before the COVID pandemic, it had already declared universal health coverage as a, as a, as a priority in the big four agenda. So yes, the COVID-19 has taken everybody by surprise. You know, nobody thought that the, the scale, the, the velocity of this pandemic would overwhelm. It overwhelmed some of the most advanced economies in the world. And, you know, fortunately, we are not seeing that level of virulence and velocity in Africa. And I hope we don't. And I hope that we are able to flatten the curve sooner rather than later, because if we were to go into what I call the big five, if you look at what happened in the US and France and uh, Italy and Spain and, and the UK, my friend, we don't have the capacity to take on that burden of disease uh, if, if people start to get highly morbid and will need all the respiratory care and the ventilators and all that. I mean, Kenya has about 516 ICU beds in this country. We are a country of 47.5 million. Do the math. So to me, it has become clear. I think the government is very clear. Even before the pandemic, UHC was prioritized. Now, I think we need to give it much more relevance. In fact, now, if I were to, if I were to be asked, out of the big four, which needs to come up on number one, it has to be universal health coverage, not just in Kenya, but for the rest of the world too. Over to you. Okay, so there's a question here from Michael Karinga. You know, we've been seeing, um, we've been citing gong heels from um, our homes and, you know, from strategic points. So it's um, generally, um, the COVID-19 has had a huge impact on our uh, environment globally. So what lifts can we borrow from the current situation um, that we can apply to the wider um, call for climate action, that is um, SDG um, number 13. I think that's a very, very pertinent and important question. Don't forget the, the COVID-19 crisis itself is a consequence of the diversity and the adversity of climate. In fact, what we are witnessing today is a very, uh, is a very malign um, a force of nature which just has not created a pandemic, but the floods and the locusts and the cyclones and the hurricanes, all that is happening all over the world. I come from the city of Calcutta, which was uh, recently flattened by the, by the, by the cyclone and thing. So, you know, I think without addressing climate, we will not be able to address the issue of universal health coverage. The fact that today you have, uh, are having zoonotic diseases that means the leaping of viruses from animals to humans is a clear indication. It's a warning sign to say, guys, we need to protect our environment. We need to protect our forests. We need to maintain the space, which means we also have to manage our population. Sorry, let me be blunt. So Kenya's population was the same as Sweden in 1956, 7 million. Sweden's population today is 10.9 million Kenya's population today is 47.6 million. The landmass has not increased. The size of the country has not increased. I come from a country which went from 250 million pre-independence to, to 1.3 billion, and we are soon beating China. Why is it that you know India, despite the fact is making great global progress, economic progress, still has 250 to 300 million people in, living in abject poverty? It's that, those are the fundamental reasons. It goes back to the issues of sexual reproductive health and rights and the primacy of women being able to take uh, informed decisions as to when they want to have their children. But it also is about how do we protect the planet? How do we ensure that we don't compete with animals and start intruding into their spaces? Everybody has a space of their own. Let's respect that space. The fact that today viruses are jumping from animals to humans is a sign of what is to come. And which is why climate is going to be an essential and in, 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 uh, absolutely integral aspect for the success of the universal health care. Over to you. So, so Sid, one last question, which is perhaps just an opportunity for you to reflect. Uh, is the world going to be different, especially from the perspective of, uh, uh, of implementing the SDGs? We've just talked about the catastrophic hemorrhage of global resources in terms of lost value over the last three or four months, two trillion shilling dollars and counting. Uh, 
we've talked about an impoverished community just merely struggling to keep economies uh, afloat. Is the commitment to SDGs going to recede in the background? And what is it that we can do globally? As you, as you say, that the recovery, the, the, the recovery and the normal after in the COVID period is going to depend solely on the SDGs. So we have to work hard to protect the SDGs, the implementation of, of, uh, of the health component of the, of the goal of health is critical, uh, just as much as the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the economy is important, but also global cooperation. But these are things that are severely undermined and eroded during this period. What are your thoughts and what is it that you put on the table in terms of uh, encouraging words uh, to, to all of us who are listening? Uh, so that we, we go home knowing that the SDGs are not dead in the water. You know, first of all, I'm actually privileged to serve in a country as the resident coordinator in Kenya, which, are, which is one of the architects of the SDGs. So, you know, uh, there is no, it's a, it's a given that we will continue to retain the focus. Here. And this is why your president, President Kenyatta, was actually chosen very carefully after there, there are, you know, there are a large number of presidents all over the world. Why him to lead on, on become a global leader on, on, the, on the Generation Unlimited? It's because there's progress which is seen. An average Kenyan, when I was in India, I would never see any, any progress. I would constantly complain. But it's only when I stepped out and I was able to see the picture of India from the outside that I saw real progress happening. Colleagues, there is real progress actually happening in this country. It's a way that we need to find a more definite way that everybody should actually feel the effect of it. That trickle down effect is mandatory. So the SDGs is going to be that North Star, is going to be that pillar around which the world has decided even before the pandemic that we are uniting. And that's why the UN Deputy Secretary General constantly reminds us that, you know, while we have a health emergency, we have a humanitarian emergency and a development emergency. And these emergencies are actually aggravating and compounding the existing inequalities, which is why the SDGs becomes even more crucial to ensure that nobody is left behind. Those inequalities are now minimized. It is because of those inequalities that you're seeing big companies starting to fail. It is because of those inequalities. Today, over 30 million people in the United States of America have actually gone for, for unemployment benefits. It's because of those inequalities that you have migrants, which is probably amongst the biggest displacement in India, post the partition of India, that had to go to when, when they were returning to their village. We will have to acknowledge and address these particular issues. And that is why the SDGs is the most democratic process that we have in place. But I would again emphasize that to us, it is clear that we have to now reprioritize. And if we focus on universal health coverage, we will find it covers, if you look at the first five SDGs, zero poverty, zero hunger, universal health coverage, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, quality education, and gender equality, goal number five. In fact, if you were to now analyze the rest of the SDGs, you will find that the primacy of health as a, as a magnifier as an accelerator, as an incubator, as a chain maker to the rest of the SDGs, it will, be, it will come into sharp focus. So having said that, I feel that the SDGs must remain the central focus of all global leaders. And this is precisely what the Secretary General of the UN and the Deputy Secretary General are doing right now through their global leadership. And I think every country should know that in this entire multilateral space, the UN in every country in the world is standing by their respective government, just like Sid as an RC is working in Kenya. There are 129 other RCs all over the work, world working with their governments, not just responding to the health emergency, but also responding to the humanitarian and the development emergency. And we are in this for the long haul. Over to you. On that very optimistic note, thank you very much, Sid. Uh, it was a great pleasure speaking with you, and uh, we look forward to connecting on future conversations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alex. Thank you, Joki, for having me on your show.